So I was at a physics conference in November and for some reason me and this group of strangers were talking about Lord of the Rings. I mentioned like my day when I want to watch the Lord of the Rings movie, which I do at least once a year. You know, you wake up with coffee in the fellowship and you have your bag of peanut butter M&Ms. By the two towers, there's a little bit where you can take like a 13 minute nap. I'm sorry, I just don't like battle scenes. They're so boring. And then you wrap up, you cry during Return of the King. And then there's that part at the end of Return of the King where it ends like 15 times and it's kind of boring. And this guy says to me, right to my face, he says, yeah, but they left out the best part. And I think he's going to say Bombadil, which is a red flag to have a conversation with a stranger with someone who's into Bombadil. But he says to me, they left out the scourge of the Shire. And I say, the what? So usually I talk about science and data and stuff, but today it's just Lord of the Rings. If you're not okay with that, that is okay. I will see you next time. Or you can check out my Patreon. Am I making an ad for my own Patreon? I have some science videos on there. But if you're new here and you're into me talking about Lord of the Rings, you should know that I often tangent for 15 to 45 minutes. So here is the table of contents of our discussion today. It's like a little book club, so cute. You could probably tell from the preamble that something I'm very embarrassed to say, I've never read the Lord of the Rings books. I know, I know, I, I tried, okay. I read The Hobbit probably when I was like nine or 10 and I loved it. You know how I hate battle scenes in movies? In The Hobbit, there's this giant battle of five armies at the end and like you're holding the book and you're like, there are seven pages left in this book. How can they do a battle of five armies? But Bilbo gets hit in the head with a rock and he wakes up after it's over. And I wish every single Marvel movie would take that and make it like a trope so we don't have to watch these things. That would be great. So Fellowship came out in 2001, I think, but it wasn't on VHS until 2002. So I'm age 12 in a blockbuster and I'm like, this looks like my jam. And I take the movie, watch it like four times in two days, return the movie, go to the library, get the Lord of the Rings books. I stopped. I did not finish Lord of the Rings. Can you guess where I stopped? So there are two very vocal Bombadil camps. People hate him. They, they find him annoying. They don't like the songs. He's not really important to the story, so why is he there? And there are people that love him. Like, they love the idea that there is this old wizard god, whatever he is, and he can hold the ring and he can play with it and it does nothing to him. And that's, like, interesting to the story of the ring where the, the ring takes power over everyone. I'm in the middle. I don't really care. I don't. Don't hate him, don't love him. Glad he wasn't in the movies. I do find his songs annoying, but like, it's fine. I do think if Bombadil had been later in the books, I would have liked him more. The idea that the ring does nothing to him would have been more real for me if it happened later in the books, like after I had seen what the ring does to Frodo, but like, it doesn't matter, it's fine. Why I stopped reading is Goldberry. Do you even remember Goldberry? No. I am not the first to point out that Tolkien, you know, doesn't really have a lot of female characters. But as a child, when I was reading these books, like I was 12, I was a kid, I I wanted to read writers who, who wrote about women, you know, little baby feminist. Like I was a simple kid. My favorite Rugrat was Angelica. My favorite Pokemon was Tangela. And my favorite Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle was Michelangelo. So when I'm reading The Lord of the Rings, who am I supposed to put my face on? Who am I supposed to put myself into? And the first character we get to is Goldberry. <sighs> so this creepy old man is married to Goldberry, who he describes as a beautiful little tiny like sexy baby that he found in a river. We meet her when he drags these four dirty hobbits that he just saved from a tree into her home and says, do you have enough food for everyone? <sighs> She feeds them all. She barely says anything. She's like a Pokemon herself. She's like, Goldberry, 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 oh, Tom. And then he sends her to bed so the men can have a conversation. And then the next day she can't say goodbye to the hobbits because it's her washing day. And I just, I don't like that. 
I've been real deep into Lord of the Rings recently and I've been reading all of these like bachelor's theses and a really common thing for people to write is about the women of Lord of the Rings and they put them into three categories where you have the Marys, the homemakers, like the lovely wives and you have the ladies with ambition who need to fucking tone it down and get married already and then you have the man-eating spiders who need to die and that's kind of it. That's what women are in Lord of the Rings and honestly as a child, that bothered me a lot. I had trouble reading it. I didn't want to finish it because in like all of the entertainment magazines, which I was obviously reading to get new Lord of the Rings movie facts at the time, they would talk about how Peter Jackson had rewritten the women. And I mean, did he? Was there screenwriters? I don't know. That was the story of the time that the women had been bulked up. They had become characters. And so I was like, I'll just get this story from the movies. This is fine. As an adult, I don't see that reading Lord of the Rings. Like the women are not written well, but it's not about women and that's okay. Not all stories have to have my face in them. I'm a big girl with big girl pants and I can read a book. Even if the author is not great at writing women, I can still enjoy their stories. Hi, Andy Weir. I mean, I'm not not annoyed by the portrayal of women in Lord of the Rings, but I can look past it and still enjoy the books. Get a margarita and a half into me and maybe I will have huge opinions on women in Lord of the Rings, but as it stands as an adult woman, I mean, it's fine. I like Lord of the Rings. As I said, I've been watching these movies every year since like they came out for 20 years now. And a few years later, as an adult, I was like, it's kind of embarrassing that I've never read Lord of the Rings. I should read Lord of the Rings. So I bought this big stupid book. This book is stupid. It shouldn't exist. It's got all of the books in here and so the pages have to be really thin and they're see-through so like you can see the text on the other page and it's like a big big heavy book. I like to read in the bath. I read on the couch. I can't read this. I can't hold this above my face. It hurts to hold. But I did read Fellowship. I read Fellowship of the Ring. I was like this was good. Hot take Lord of the Rings is good, actually, I guess. And I was just going to take a little break. A little break before I read The Two Towers. And, uh... Yeah. yeah. I know. I think it's hard to approach genre-defining media. Like, Lord of the Rings is the fantasy book. Imagine you're a 13-year-old that likes rock music right now. And it sounds like this. And then your grandparents are like, I loved rock music too. I listened to Steely Dan. And you go look up Steely Dan and it sounds like this. <laughs> then you're like, how is this rock music? And it takes time for you to appreciate that genre defining media because it has shaped and structured all of the rock songs that have come after it. Lord of the Rings has shaped and structured all of the fantasy novels that have come after it. So if you go jump into the Lord of the Rings, it's kind of like you've already read it before. It's kind of boring. It's kind of reductive. Like you've already seen this. You've already seen all these tropes. You've already seen all these stories represented in different ways. And so you're reading it and you're kind of bored. I know I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know I just like, I'm not, I'm not into books with maps. I'm not into reading songs. I wish I could have been one of those people who read Lord of the Rings when they were eight and have read it every year since and loved it and appreciated it for what it is and how good it is. It is very good. I've read them now. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. It's just, it's kind of hard to jump in. But I had this conversation and this man, this stranger who has changed my life because now I'm into Lord of the Rings, told me that I could just read the th last three chapters. He was like, yeah, the books, they're massive. It's kind of a whole thing to approach it but just grab the book read the last three chapters like you already know the story you you have to read scourge of the shire but i didn't want to do that i wanted to read the books and i did read the books let me tell you how this changed for me i i went to the thrift store i was looking for copies of return of the king that i could actually hold and read and not stupid giant books that shouldn't exist i'm gonna I don't even want to donate this because I don't want to force someone to hold this in their hands. But then I thought I should do the audiobook. I mean, I, I sometimes have to commute to work. I, I spend a lot of time coding. I can listen to books. And yeah, it's going to be a hundred hours long, but maybe I could listen to Lord of the Rings. And this actually brings us to our sponsor. 
This video is sponsored by your local library. If you're American, I don't know how libraries work in other countries. Did you know libraries are free? Have you seen that viral tweet about how libraries are one of the last places in America that you can go to and they don't expect you to spend money? You just tell them where you live, they give you a little card and you can take books home, you can take movies home, you can rent video games. I'm not actually sponsored by your local library. I will just take any opportunity to talk about how good libraries are. They're constantly under attack and they're wonderful, beautiful spaces of community and gathering and they offer so much to people and books are important. Um, okay, anyway, with your library card, you can get the Libby app. The Libby app has eBooks, it has magazines, it has comics, it has audiobooks. Okay, so I search Lord of the Rings and I see this and I listen to the sample and I'm like, all right, but then, I was like, oh, a different version. Perfect. I downloaded that sample. Andy Serkis, Gollum himself, has released all three books of Lord of the Rings. To Pippin's surprise, he found that much of the talk was intelligible. Many of the orcs were using ordinary language. Apparently, the members of two or three quite different tribes were present, and they could not understand one another's orc speech. There's no time to kill them properly. He reads all three books. He does the songs. There are scenes in the two towers where like 10 orcs are talking to each other and he does 10 distinct yet orc-like voices. This is the perfect way to enjoy Lord of the Rings. This is the hot take of the video. Andy Serkis reading Lord of the Rings is better than the Lord of the Rings movies. I know they're different mediums. I'm just saying this is the most fun I've ever had with Lord of the Rings and I watch the movies and we'll continue to watch the movies every single year. He does all the voices of hundreds of characters. He moves his head around the microphone so it sounds like people are having conversations in a room. He sings the songs and I didn't skip them. They were so good. This is the way to enjoy Lord of the Rings. If you're like me and you, you struggle bust your way through fellowship, get these audiobooks. I mean, you'll have to wait. So I had this conversation in November on the plane ride back. I'm like, I'm reading Lord of the Rings. I put this book on hold. I didn't get it till the end of January. I listened to like five hours to make sure I was gonna finish it because they're all over 20 hours long and I put the next one on hold. I had to wait 12 more weeks and I didn't finish them until May, but they were so good. Do people get Grammys or Oscars or something for reading audiobooks? Because he deserves all the awards for these. Okay, so I did it. I did it. I read Lord of the Rings, the whole thing, and I loved them. They're so good. Is, is that a controversial opinion? Guys, the Lord of the Rings is good, actually. I'm just kidding. I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm still sorry. I, I wish I wish I could go back and read them. Some differences. First of all, my favorite character, Faramir. No one told me that he's bulked up in the books. I would have read them years ago. I love Faramir. Uh, you, of course, have the Bombadil stuff that's missing. Sam is kind of the main character in the books, whereas in the movies it's Frodo. That's interesting. But overall... The Lord of the Rings movies match the books. It's a great retelling, except for the end. And that's what I want to talk about today. First, let's recap the ending of Lord of the Rings, the books. Gollum bites Frodo's finger, falls to his death. I'm glad you're here with me, here at the end of all things, Sam. Back in the battle. They see the ring bearer has fulfilled his quest. Gandalf asks the eagle for a ride. Sam convinces Frodo to try and go down the mountain, even though Frodo thinks they are done and it's no use. Oh no, they can't be saved. Sam looks real sad. He looks away at the sky and talks about what a great story this would have been. <coughs> Sam wakes up in bed. Gandalf laughs. Frodo says he fell asleep waiting for him to wake up. See, see Sam's the main character in the books. And there's a big elf party. They all heal up, get ready to go to Minas Tirith. Minas Tirith is stressed. Faramir falls in love with Eowyn. They see the darkness break. Oh my goodness, the war is over. Aragorn comes back. Faramir gives him keys to the city and wants Aragorn to be king for some reason that I don't really get. He doesn't take the crown from Faramir and he gives it to Frodo and Frodo gives it to Gandalf and puts it on his head. I don't get that, but it was mentioned. Uh, behold the king, the city's rejuvenated and such. Everyone's hanging out at Minas Tirith for days and days and days and days. Gandalf says the age of men has come and he shall soon go. 
it turns out they'd been waiting for elves to show up. So Elrond and Arwen, and then there's like a wedding. Frodo asks Aragorn if he can go to the Shire, but first he has to go to Rivendell. I keep calling Rivendell Arendell. It's really annoying. Frodo wants to go to Rivendell to see Bilbo. Arwen says that because he held the ring for so long, he's like all damaged now and he won't be making any more journeys. Arwen gives him a piece of flair and says he can go to the Havens with Elrond in her stead. Aomir and Gimli have a fake fight about if Arwen is hotter than Galadriel. I mean, yeah, get me a margarita and we'll talk about women in Lord of the Rings, but not today. We don't need to. Uh, so many, many days later, they all head out. Theoden is buried outside Rohan. Aomir becomes king of Rohan, but that's cool. Like, Aeolin doesn't want to be king anyway, even though she's the one that did all the slaying of the big bad and stuff. She gets to marry Faromir, and, and they get to be stewards. So, it's the same. They head to Isengard. You know, these books should come with maps. All this traveling, who knew? Like, I'm not, I'm not into books with maps. Like, I'm not, I'm not into books with maps. Like, I'm not, I'm not into books with maps. They chat with Treebeard. The Fellowship splits up, oh no. Gimli and Legolas go with Treebeard to look at old trees. Aragorn takes off. They travel for days and days. They run into Saruman. I'm just hanging out like a beggar in the road. Galadriel and Gandalf offer mercy. He denies them. Grimla is still there and they tell him to leave, but he's scared. Saruman asks for pipeweed. He steals a bag from Mary. He mentions something about South Farthing, which worries the boys. Frodo says they gotta get to Rivendell. They see Bilbo on his birthday. They stay a fortnight. They ask Elrond to leave. Gandalf says he will go too, at least as far as Bree. Elrond tells Frodo that he and Bilbo are gonna head out next year, you know, like if he wants to go. Gandalf notices Frodo is in pain on the way home. They go to the Prancing Pony. They decide to head to the Shire. Gandalf is like, ah, oh, you're fine. Uh, you might run into some trouble, but like, you got this. I gotta go talk to Bombadil. Hopefully he has to talk to Bombadil about how Goldberry left him to go live with the Antwives. That's, that's my dream. But luckily we don't actually have to hear from Bombadil again. All right, here we are. We're in it. Okay, get ready. They get to the Shire and it's locked. The gatekeeper says he's under orders not to let anyone in. Frodo assumes that Lotho is in charge. That's like his cousin that earlier in the books he wanted to have back end. Um, did I mention, did I mention that Merry and Pimpin are like huge now? They're like the tallest hobbits in the world. They drank something with Treebeard that made them grow tall, so they kind of just climb the fence. And they're also all in armor, and so all the other hobbits are like, we're not messing with these dudes. They can kind of just go in. They climb the gate. They walk into Hobbit. A giant group of Hobbit cops say they're under arrest. The heroes just laugh and keep walking. Then a group of men come up and say they don't work for Lotho, they work for Sharky. And they threaten Frodo. The three Hobbits draw swords. In this chapter, Frodo never draws a sword. He never does any fighting. He like heals the people who have fallen in battle, but he says that he doesn't want to hurt anybody. The men leave. The boys find Farmer Cotton and make an army. They threaten to fight the men after the battle and the men surrender. Well, then we learn about what's been happening in the Shire. First, Lotho was buying up all this land and he couldn't tend all the land. So there was a food shortage. So these men came in and at first they were very nice and respectful, but then they started breaking stuff. And at first Lotho would like pay for it and offer to fix it. And then eventually it was overrun by these like grimy men breaking everything. So Shargi comes in, takes over. He makes a bunch of hobbits cops and that's where we're at. Uh, Tolkien's description here of his like industrialization of the Shire, all the trees are cut down. Like the pipe weed is being grown, but taken somewhere else. So the hobbits don't have it. It's a whole thing. Everyone's upset about it. The next day, a hundred men show up and then Pippin rolls up with an army of Tooks, 70 men and 19 hobbits die in the Battle of Bywater, which is the last battle of the War of the Ring. They immediately march to Bag End. They find that Sharky is actually Saruman, who immediately curses Hobbitum, and then Frodo says that he has no power. Sharky stabs Frodo, but Frodo's got that vest thing. Frodo demands mercy. Sharky is pissed again. They ask about Lotho, and apparently Grimma was told to kill Lotho by Saruman. And then Grimma's very mad. He stabs Saruman in the back, and the other hobbits, not, not our four main boys, but the army of hobbits, draw their arrows and shoot Grimma to death. They rebuild the Shire. Sam uses a gift from Galadriel to rebuild all the trees and stuff, especially because he was really devastated about the party tree being cut down. Sam marries Rosie. They move into Bag End. Sam, Mary, and Pippin work to rebuild the Shire. Sam has a baby and asks Frodo what to name her since it's a girl, because if it was a boy, he would have named it Frodo. And they land on Eleanor. El Elanor. Ooh, I'm probably pronouncing all these names wrong. They land on Elanor. <laughs> Just for fun, imagine if Lord of the Rings was written by J.K. Rowling, what would she have named Sam's baby? Okay, if it was a boy, I would say Frodo Sauron. And if it was a girl, Galadriel Aragorn a Wormtongue. 
because it would be bad. Luckily, we have Eleanor, which is a beautiful name for Sam's baby. So Frodo is frequently in pain. He's hiding it from Sam. Frodo finishes his story. Frodo asks Sam to go with him to Rivendell and see Bilbo one last time. Sam is such a good father. He's like, I can't go all the way. I can't leave my family. Oh my goodness, what a hero. And they actually end up just going to the Grey Havens to see Bilbo off. So Bilbo, Gandalf, Elrond, and Galadriel and all the other elves are taking their little boats to Valinor and Bilbo gets on the boat for one last adventure and then what? Frodo's going too? Oh my goodness. Uh, Sam watches the ship leave. Merry and Pippin arrive in the field to watch with them and they're like devastated and they cry a lot. Sam goes back to Bag End, hugs his baby and says, I'm back. Okay, so that's the end of Lord of the Rings. I loved it. I love the scourge of the Shire. I want to discuss. And if there's one thing I know about Jolkin, Rolkin, Rolkin, Tolkien is that he wants us to read Lord of the Rings as a World War II allegory. So in France, I'm just kidding. She's got jokes. I know he, he actually doesn't want us to do that. Tolkien doesn't do allegory. All of the forums I've been reading, just they repeat it. it Tolkien doesn't do allegory. It's not an allegory. Stop it. So instead, I'm not going to talk about Tolkien at all. He, he doesn't want us to mention that he saw two world wars in combat and he was a code breaker in World War II during, you know, the blitz and stuff. He doesn't want us to talk about it. So let's talk about Jean-Paul Sartre. I looked it up. I think it's Sartre. Let me know in the comments below if you were rich and you learned French in high school. Sartre has this essay called On Occupation where he talks about what it was like living in France when the Nazis were occupying the country. So I'm not a historian, I'm so sorry, but the French had this government that was like, you know, I, I'm pretty cool with fascism and Nazis. And so even though the people were against it, the Germans went in and were able to just be like, cool, you're Nazis now. And this essay talks about the weird normalcy of occupation. So you're a normal French woman working in a cafe because you know you're occupied but you still have to go to work. And a German soldier comes in and he's dressed like a Nazi because he is a Nazi and it's actually not normal to have Nazis just proudly be Nazis in your cafe. But you're occupied, you have to offer him a croissant. And the weird thing is, is that the Germans were trained to be very polite and kind. They all knew French because they learned it in school. So he asks you in perfect French for an espresso and a croissant and you give it to him and he says, thank you, this is delicious. And he's very polite and he sees two little French kids and they're just hanging out and he's like patting them on the head. Like, what great little French kids you are. And he leaves and he holds the door open for the next customer. And then he says like, oh, by the way, do you have directions to this place? And you know, in your head, that if you give this man directions, he is looking for someone there and he's gonna take that someone and kill them or put them in a camp or do something terrible. And you don't wanna give him that information, but you can't be like, I'm not gonna tell you anything, you Nazi, because of this whole thing, like you're, Sartre talks about how this type of thing would happen and the people who are victims in the situation, I don't think he's blaming the French citizens in this essay, he's talking about how that interaction was so normal, but it's also not normal at all. And so they kind of had this weird, like, I guess I just give him the information or maybe they would have the forethought to be like, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know where that is. Have a great day, bye. But, but everyone was acting like it was normal to be occupied. And I don't know, I kind of read the essay as like a warning of when you feel yourself accepting fascism as normalcy, you have you have to do something. You can't you can't let this happen. It's not normal. It's not normal, but we're all acting like it's normal. Is this normal? Is this normal? None of this is normal, but we're acting like it's normal. And so like, I guess, I guess since he's, I've lost the plot here. So Tolkien describes being occupied in a very similar way to the way Sartre describes his real actual occupation that happened and is totally different from Lord of the Rings, which is not an allegory for anything. In the Lord of the Rings, so Tom Cotton describes it as like, yeah, some of the hobbits are super into it and became cops, but most of the hobbits are like not, 
they're not into causing a fuss and they, it just kind of happened. Like, it was just like, oh, we have rules now. Oh, we have cops now. Oh, there's a food shortage now. And they just kind of accepted it as the new normal. And I love the way Tolkien describes fascism, like encroaching onto Hobbiton. Like it's, it's industrialization for industrialization's sake. Like they're not making anything. They just have pollution now. And they cut down all the trees because take away all the little happiness from the hobbits you can and it's just like there's a lot of cops for some reason too many cops you don't need that many cops actually it's kind of a bad sign if you need that many cops in a tiny teeny tiny little hamlet that's never had any problems so what i love about the scourge of the shire is that in this book where frodo has held on to this big bad ring for like is it like 50 years and Gandalf goes to the library for three years and even the, like Gandalf is like make haste and it takes them two weeks to pack their bags. Every step of this war is slow and plodding. They have to meet to decide what to do about the ring and have a vote and form a fellowship and they have to convince Rohan and Gondor to, to be together and there's so much talking and Treebeard has to convince all the Ents and it takes hours and hours and everything is so slow in this book our four hobbits show up at the shire realize it's been overtaken and it is occupied by fascists it takes them 12 hours to be like fuck this they form an army two days of battle and they are at bag end being like get the fuck out it's such a beautiful end of the story mary and pippin started as these loafabouts roll back into hobbiton as giant soldiers and they take action right away like Sam, who was like secretly spying and trying to like listen to what Frodo says and then followed him around for this whole journey is now like, I'm gonna go talk to Tom Cotton. I'm gonna figure this out. It's so good. We see them grow and change and learn and they do it so quickly. I love that this takes place in like three days. At the start of this chapter, whenever Gandalf's like, yeah, like it's gonna be a problem, but you got it. And he just takes off. I'm like, what? They had this whole fellowship. Gandalf knew there was a problem and he didn't say like, Gimli, Legolas, why don't you just go with the hobbits for like two days? He didn't. He was like, you got this. And they did. They got, they, they had it. It's so good. The biggest change in this ending, in my opinion, in my reading of the book, guys, leave your opinions below, is how Frodo is portrayed. In the movies, it's kind of like, Oh, I'm a little sore, Sam. <laughs> I'm just gonna go to, to Valinor. In the book, there are many paragraphs devoted to how much pain Frodo is in. He, he doesn't draw a sword in this whole battle. It's like he has decided that he will not do any suffering to anybody because he has suffered for so long. At the end, he's begging Sharky to just apologize, to just not be an evil person. He keeps mentioning Gollum. I'm so glad we didn't kill Gollum because Gollum was the one that saved the day at the end. He he fell with the ring and if he hadn't had done that, the mission would not have been resolved. And he just wants to see the good in everybody, which I think is so weird. I mean, I get him not wanting to kill the hobbits in the battle, but Saruman is responsible for all of this. He's damaged your home and you're just you're just gonna let him walk away and that that brings me back to occupation in world war ii there are all these stories about the liberation of france where the brits and the americans and the canadians and i don't know world war ii history i'm literally remembering like doctor who episodes they show up normandy you know and they kind of sweep through the country and get rid of the German soldiers. And there's a lot of trials that that just end in executions. And there's a lot of straight up executions of Germans. I will tell you the story I learned in AP US history, which was told to me as like a factual story. And I just, there's no way this is a factual story. So a group of Americans find a bunch of German soldiers in a French cellar in the countryside. The, the Germans are in there. They don't have any weapons. They don't have any food. They've been in there for days. They're just like hiding and the american goes to find like the french lieutenant because the french are in charge it's their country and he's like hey bud 
what should we do with these guys? Where should we take them? Do you guys have forms? Like, where do we put the prisoners of war? And the French guy's like, I'll take care of it. And he sends a French soldier who throws a grenade into the cellar, shuts the door, and like walks away. And he's like, took care of it. And the American is like, Whoa. and the French is like, try being occupied. I don't think that's a real story. It's got way too much cool guy walks away from explosions. But there is this difference at the end of World War II in the behavior of the people whose countries were occupied and the behavior of the peoples whose country was not. You feel differently about the solution to the problem when it was directly affecting your home and your family and your children, you know? And Frodo's behavior in this war leads me to believe that he does not think the Shire is his home anymore. He is acting like a foreign soldier who is like, let's solve this problem. Let's solve it as easily and quickly as we can. Whereas Mary and Pip and our Sam are like, let's do some fucking business. Frodo is very willing to help. He wants to solve the problem. He knows what needs to be done and he does not stop the boys from doing battle and killing humans. He does hold them back. He's like, don't kill the hobbits. Like, we should have a conversation first. We don't need to do this. Let's be as deliberate as we can in just ending this problem as quickly with as little harm as we can. Frodo doesn't live there. That's not Frodo's home. And the more I thought about it, the more his depression in the later chapters got sadder and sadder to me. The desperation when he wanted Saruman to be forgiven and to become a good person, it was like he was just clinging at straws at like trying to feel feelings. Frodo's not really Frodo in the last few chapters. Frodo's like a shell of the man he was. It's not a World War II allegory. But something we do learn from war is that sometimes you don't come home and sometimes you do come home, but you're not really the guy that left. And in the, in the movie, when Frodo gets on the boat, like the hobbits are sad, but it's like a bittersweet ending. It's like if your roommate from college who's best friends with you got a really good job in South Korea and you take her to the airport and you're like really sad because the time zone you're never gonna go to South Korea but you're also happy for her she's doing great she's going on a new adventure and so it's a bittersweet ending the book is just sad the book is not like bye Frodo have a good time oh the book is like Guys, why didn't anybody tell me that Frodo dies at the end of Lord of the Rings? So we will discuss the death of Frodo, but first, do you think the book ending belongs in the movie? And I am going to say no. I like the movie ending, even though there are like 26 of them. The ending of the movie. So, Fellowship, the Sons of Gondor of Rohan, my brothers, draw the eye away from Sam and Frodo. Aragorn delivers an Independence Day style speech. The Shire theme play. Never thought I'd die side by side fighting by an elf. What about a friend? Sam holds Frodo like the hero he is. Do you remember the Shire, Mr. Frodo? It'll be spring soon. I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you. Sauron whispers out to Aragorn with his sweet, sweet talk. Don't worry, he doesn't listen. For Frodo, run and yell toward death. I love that Merry and Pippin are like the first to go right after Aragorn. Clever hobbits to climb so high. Gollum chokes Frodo, struggle, Sam slashes Gollum, Frodo's running up that hill. They destroy it. Go on, now. Throw it into the fire. What are you waiting for? Just let it go. Frodo puts on the ring. Gollum tackles Frodo, they fight. Sam's been rocked in the head so he can't help. Gollum bites Frodo's finger off. The boys are losing the battle, babes. Frodo fights Gollum for the ring. Gollum and Frodo appear to fall. Gollum gets eaten by the volcano, followed by the ring. Gotcha. Frodo's hanging on with one hand. Take my hand, oh no, it's a bloody nub. Don't you let go. Ring melts, ice creams, towers crumble, armies fall into sinkhole, it's fine, volcano erupts. The hobbits realize after their victory that Frodo is dead. I can see the Shire, the Brandywine River, Bag End. Notice that Frodo in the movie is the one that brings up the Shire at the end. I think that's an interesting change. This movie is so good. I love that they hug. 
Frodo's in bed. It's that gif of Gandalf laughing and everyone comes in. Aragorn is crowned. Now come the days of the king, you know, because the days of wizards and men is over. Eowyn and Faramir are there. Vigo sings a song. He's so good in this movie. Arwen and Elrond appear. Apparently some people take this as a wedding. I didn't know there was a wedding until I read the books, but that's fine. My friends, you bow to no one. Everyone bows to the tiny hobbit. It looks like that scene in Star Wars where Leia's handing out the medals of Yavin. The fourth age of Middle-earth begins and the fellowship ends. Thirteen months to the day, they get back. There's our boy Andy Serkis, the real Lord of the Ring, carrying a pumpkin. Sam, Sam sees Rosie. He's got courage now. Sam and Rosie have a wedding. How do you go on when in your heart you begin to understand there's no going back? There are some things that time cannot mend. Some hurts that go too deep. Frodo writes a book. Hey, that's the name of this movie. Frodo still feels pain, his wound hasn't healed, Gandalf's back in the Shire, Super old Bilbo and Frodo go to the harbor, the elves have told Bilbo he gets a place on the last ship to leave Middle Earth, the hobbits see Bilbo off, Kate Blanchett is so good in this movie. Farewell my brave hobbits, Gandalf turns, it's time Frodo, oh shit, they didn't know Frodo was going. The Shire has been saved, but not for me, hugs. I find this smile that Frodo does really goofy and weird. A ship goes out, fades, Sam's at bag end, nice, he's got a little baby, two little babies. My dear Sam, your part of the story will go on. I'm back, Sam, the end. I like the, the end of the movie, even though there are like 26 places where it should just stop and we don't need to see all of that. There are two reasons I don't think you need the scourge of the Shire in the movie. If they were to put that in, Return of the King is already four hours long. It would be like eight hours long. We can't do that. Uh, secondly, if you have this big, big bad boss battle with with the War of the Ring and the, the, the Doom and the, the volcano, you can't like leave that and then be like, oh, and then they go fight a battle with a hundred people in the Shire. It's like this big ending and then a little teeny tiny one. I mean, maybe you could have put it in. I really enjoyed it in the book. But books and movies are different mediums. But I think what the film does really expertly is changes the way they talk about the Shire throughout the movie. So in the movie, the hobbits say the lines from the books where they talk about how they can't wait to get back to the Shire. They talk about the things they missed from the Shire. They talk about missing Rosie Cotton. And the thing about seeing it on a film is that the, there are actors and they are acting. If we were to draw a graph of my process, of my method, something like this, Sir Ian, Sir Ian, Sir Ian, action. Wizard, you shall not pass! Cut! Sir Ian, Sir Ian, Sir Ian. That scene where Sam is begging Frodo to eat, he's like, don't worry, I've rationed enough for the return trip. I don't believe him. I don't believe any of the hobbits when they talk about how they're going back to the Shire in the movie. They are saying it to like bolster their confidence. Sam spends the entire third movie convincing Frodo they can make it up that stupid hill and he will sing anything to get him there, including lying about how they're going to get back to the Shire. I don't think Sam thinks they're going back to the Shire. I don't think Merry and Pippin think they're going back to the Shire. So at the end of the movie, when Frodo and Sam are lying there on top of a volcano, and Frodo's like, let's think about the Shire, Sam. And it's a role reversal, where Frodo is now trying to protect Sam's spirit. He's trying to raise him up and be like, let's imagine the Shire. Let's think about the Shire. Let's do what you've been doing for me this whole time. And it's beautiful. And it's a lovely little bow on that thing about them lying about getting back to the Shire the whole time. And then, oh my God, they actually go back to the Shire. So when you see them having a pint in a pub in the Shire, you're like, they did it. And they're all smiling at each other and it kind of seems like goodwill hunting for some reason, I don't know. But you, is that your thing? You come into a bar, you read some obscure passage and then pretend you, you pawn it off as your, own, as your own idea just to impress some girls, embarrass my friend? You're so happy. That is the happy ending. That is the happy ending for the boys. They did it. They didn't think they were going to get back to the Shire, and they did. And I know the Scourge of the Shire is kind of in the mirror for a second, whatever. They don't have to do the Scourge of the Shire, because the way they talked about the Shire the whole time led me to believe that they believed they didn't think they would get back. So when they do get back, that's the happy ending. It's a totally different vibe in the book. In the book, when Sam is walking up that hill, talking about how he can't wait to get back to the Shire, I don't, I, I think he thinks he's gonna get back to the Shire. When he tells Frodo he saved food for the return journey, I believe him and I think Frodo was pissed that he's been hungry this whole time when he could have been eating this food because obviously they're gonna die. 
Frodo knows they're not going back to the Shire. Sam, Merry, and Pippin, they all think they're going back to the Shire. Throughout the books, they're like, we have to do this big thing, but just wait, we'll get back to the Shire. And what's really cool reading the books is that there are all these clues throughout the story that lead the reader to realize that the Shire is not, not okay. I'll give you an example. After the Battle of Isengard, Merry and Pippin are like smoking their pipe weed and eating their porks and they're so happy. And as a reader, you're like, boys, where does pipe weed come from? Stop getting high for two seconds and use your brains to realize where does pipe weed come from? What is the implication of pipe weed at such large quantities being in Isengard? Where did they get it? Boys boys <laughs> and they don't they don't think about it they think in the book the hobbits think that they will go back to their tiny little peaceful beautiful hamlet and everything's gonna be fine this is just a task they have to get through and then they will go back and everything will be fine so when you're reading it at the end they destroy the ring and you're like great we did it um but then the tension is kind of building because all of these things are happening like th they go to a coronation and then a wedding and then a funeral and then then they want to like just walk really slowly to Rivendell for a while they're they're taking months and months to return back and every time they stop to do a thing you're like boys you have to get back to the Shire what are you doing how can you not realize something's happening in the Shire and then they go and they hang out with Bilbo for a fortnight until Frodo's like maybe we should should we do you guys feel weird and this is after they saw they saw Saruman that was talking about the Shire he mentioned the Shire and they're like eh, well, I'll just go to Rivendell for a fortnight first so the movie which has all these endings where you're like all right wrap this up in the book you have all these endings you have all the like the b character stories being wrapped up but the whole time you're like okay this is really great for faramir so glad he's married but like we gotta go we gotta get out of here we gotta get to the shire so when they get to the shire you're just like finally they're gonna take care of it and it's so good by having these two different portrayals in the book and the movie, it means you can have two different endings and it's totally fine. I, I, I like the book better. The book's better than the movie. Who would have thought? Oh my goodness. So you have this tension, 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 tension building. They get to the Shire. And what I love about this chapter, I've already mentioned it, the boys immediately go into action. In, in this book where everything takes 50 fucking years, the hobbits are like three days and we have just rid the, the Shire of fascism. We've knocked it out. We've killed Saruman. It's fine. Let's rebuild, guys. We did it. It's amazing. But the Frodo chapters are so bleak. The movie has like one mention of Frodo being like, it's four years to the day. Oh, man. And Sam's like, yeah, bud, you're in pain. In the book, he's like a shell of himself. He's constantly in pain. He's hiding it from Sam. He's he's talking about how he can't go on and he's he's hiding it from his loved ones and he's just laying in bed for days at a time having attacks of pain and he doesn't see the point of being in the Shire. He doesn't see the point of being a part of the world. I have a quote Though I may come to the Shire, it will not seem the same, for I shall not be the same. I am wounded with knife, sting, and tooth, and a long burden. Where shall I find rest? He's in unspeakable pain, and it gets worse over time, and he, and he holds out for years. Like, Sam gets married, he has babies, and he just, he can't do it anymore. And nobody told me that he dies at the end. I mean, it makes sense that he dies. Like, how can he go on? He keeps saying that. He can't go on. But the movie, <laughs> the movie's just like, bye guys, see you later. He dies in the book. Nobody told me he dies in the book. I can't believe I've been, I've been enjoying Lord of the Rings content for 20 years and nobody told me that Frodo dies at the end of Lord of the Rings. Not everyone agrees with me. And that's okay. You don't have to agree with me, but I will make my argument for how Frodo dies at the end of Lord of the Rings. And, and then we can discuss in the comments. But only in the form of hour-long YouTube videos. If you, if you have a response video, link me in the comments. Otherwise, I mean, follow your heart. Well, first of all, he doesn't die. He goes to the Undying Lands. Oh, I'm sorry. Frodo doesn't die. 
he just goes to a land where mortals are not allowed to be and it's a heaven utopia far across the sea that mortals haven't even seen ever actually he doesn't die he just goes to heaven okay what do you have to do to go to heaven guys but tolkien doesn't do allegory he says they go to valinor he says they go to the undying lands that's what they do and then <laughs> Like, I have to beg you to understand the difference in allegory and euphemism. Allegory would be like, in The Lord of the Rings, Isengard is Poland. Let's let's work backwards from there on the map. That's not what I'm doing. This, this is a euphemism. This is a nice way to say that Frodo goes to heaven. Frodo's character, he's had this unbearable weight on his shoulders for this entire journey. He... He failed in his task, by the way, which Sam and Frodo never talk about. Frodo puts on the ring and he doesn't toss it into the, into the volcano. It just happens that Gollum bites his finger off and takes the ring with him. Sam and Frodo never discuss this. I think Frodo feels a lot of guilt about that. He's, he's in constant pain that many elves have told him will never end for him and will get worse over time. He's, he's started like wrapping up all of the big things he wants to do in his life. Like he was like, I'm going to finish this book. And he finally finished it. And he gave away his home and all his belongings to his friend. And he was like, I just want to make one last journey to visit my favorite relative. If your friend was doing all of those things, what would you think was about to happen? He goes to Valinor. I mean, it's right there in the text. Like, just re read the book. But we could just ask Tolkien. Tolkien's written about it in letters. Of course, we can look and see what Tolkien says about what happens to mortals after they die. We can look at it. Read it if you want. Do you think if Tolkien wrote Lord of the Rings in 2004 instead of 1954 he would be on Twitter and he would just be tweeting like here's how they went to the bathroom on their journey thanks for asking I bet if he did write Lord of the Rings in 2004 instead of 1954 in Helm's Deep there would be a scene where like a ring wraith slams into a tower and a bunch of soldiers fall to their deaths and when people said that was a 9-11 allegory he would be like how dare you how dare you say that? You can read the text and it's it's up to you how you interpret it. If you don't think he dies and he goes to Valinor where everyone's happy and it's all good, then okay, that's not how I read the text. And actually, I don't think we should look at his letters and decide how that affects the text. Maybe we should interpret it for ourselves. That's right, I read books. Well, haven't you read the Silmarillion? Is that how you pronounce it? Silmarillion? Or have you seen the Rings of Power? And like, yeah, of course I have. I just told you how I've been reading Lord of the Rings forums for the past six months. I've been reading a bunch of people's bachelor's theses where they compare The Sopranos to Lord of the Rings. Like I've been enjoying every piece of Lord of the Rings I can. Have I seen Rings of Power? Let me tell you what, the fact that the Land Before Times 2 through 37 exist does not change what happened in the first movie, which is that Littlefoot dies sad and alone in the forest and then wakes up in the Great Valley and all his family and friends are there, even his parents who died. That's what happened in the movie. Writing stuff after doesn't change the text of the first movie, okay? Frodo dies at the end of Lord of the Rings. There's this real ominous thing that happens at the end of Lord of the Rings where Frodo tells Sam, like, I have to go to the Undying Lands. I can't be on this earth anymore. I'm in so much pain. And then he says, it will happen to you too, because you were a ring bearer as well. And in, in the book, Sam has to wear the ring for a little bit. And it's so like, if you're depressed very depressed friend said that to you as like a prediction you would be worried about them right but also in the book in the appendix sam goes to the undying lands well actually let's just read what happens to sam let me find my good copy okay so death of mistress rose wife of master samwise on mid-year's day 
On September 22, Master Samwise rides out from Bag End. He comes to the Tower Hills and is last seen by Eleanor, to whom he gives the Red Book, afterwards kept by Fairbairns. Among them, the tradition is handed down from Elanor that Samwise passed the towers and went to the Grey Havens and passed over sea, last of the ring bearers. So Sam doesn't really go to Valinor at the end of Lord of the Rings, does he? The appendix says that he tells Elanor that he's going. He gives her his most prized possession and then is not seen again. It doesn't say he goes to Valinor, does it? It says his wife dies. He gives his daughter his most prized possession, and then he's not seen again. He tells her he's going to Valinor, but he's not seen again. How does he get there? Does he build a boat? Oh, I know a guy with a boat. I know a guy with a boat that can take mortals to the land of the dead. His name's Karen, but you have to die before you get on that boat. He, so how does he get there? There is, there is, there is reference to... Legolos and Gimli building a boat and they go to Valinor later so like I mean I guess if you're reading it that this is an actual place that exists Sam could have got on that boat I guess but no no I don't think so it doesn't say that Sam tells Eleanor that he's gonna meet Gimli and Legolos it doesn't say that it just says he was never seen again what does that say to you like Frodo dies at the end and so does Sam because they're mortals. Death is just another path we must take, and that's okay. It's a sad ending, but it's a really good ending. Um, thanks for watching. So I quit Twitter and now I'm just like reading books, I guess. These are the last four books I've read. Here they are. Um, you can tell I was reading Sartre. Uh, this is really good. This is about parenting, actually. Did you know that? I, I had no idea. Um, it's really good. This was also really good. And I, I reread this for this video. And... Something that I noticed about all of these books is that I thought they were really sad. I just got depressed reading these books. Even this one, which Sartre explicitly says the goal of this lecture was to convince people that existentialism is not depressing and is a philosophy of hope. So that didn't work for me. I liked it, but it didn't it didn't convince me. It was hopeful. And then I thought like if all the books I'm reading are depressing me. M maybe it's not the books. Guys, I'm not having a great time right now. 
lol uh it's it's nothing to do with like my life or my channel or like what's happening at all it's just i'm one of those people that just like has has bad times for a couple years every couple of years um lol it's fine but the reason i bring this up is because you know how the season of life you're in can affect how you interpret media the best example is of course when you read something or watch a movie when you're like 14 and you tell everyone how good it is and then you're like 22 and you rewatch fight club and you're like oh yikes kind of like that i think because i'm not having a great time right now it's fine I'm just reading these to be sadder than they're intended to be, and I would like to try again. So, not this year, maybe next winter, you know, November 2024, I will reread these books when I'm hopefully in a better mood, and maybe the ending will seem a little happier to me. I mean, Frodo's still gonna die. Frodo dies at the end of Lord of the Rings, but maybe I'll feel better <laughs> about it. Okay, bye.